All right, I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Um, I promised Patty I would try to make it as lively and entertaining as possible. Um, I happen to really enjoy remodeling, so hopefully that comes out as we're talking about this. Specifically, what we're planning on talking about is uncovering the hidden potential within your home. Um, as the title implies, we're primarily focusing on improvements to the interior of your home using the existing space and square footage that's available. Now, to the extent of finding the issues associated with homes that prompt people to remodel are as varied as the individual homeowners. The opportunities that are available to do the remodeling differ from home to home. So to be able to kind of put some context into the presentation tonight, what I chose to do is talk about one specific style of home, a 5-4 and a door. The reason I decided on that is there are tens of thousands of them in Atlanta, and as a result of that, we've worked on a lot of them, which gives me a lot of pictures to share with you tonight. Um, for those of that, you that are not familiar with a 5-4 and a door, essentially it is a two-story home where the main structure of the house has five windows across the top, four windows on the first floor, and a door in the middle. Now the houses vary in size. Some are bigger, some are smaller. They all typically have the garage wing. Depending on the size of the house, the garage may be right up against the main body of the house. In others, it may be separated by additional living space. Some of these homes have bonus rooms above the garage. Some of them have additions off the back. Some have wings on the opposite side of the house. They may have a screen porch, deck, additional living uh, areas out to the back of the house. Um, they also may change a little bit. So if you look at the configuration of the windows, some of these houses have bay windows instead of in place of two windows. But the interior of the homes are very consistent and similar and raise very consistent issues for the homeowners that live in them. Um, to the extent you don't happen to own a 5-4 and a door, it's okay. A lot of the issues that you're going to see that we talk about tonight are relevant to all different styles of home. And so hopefully it'll be beneficial to everybody. So how are we going to approach it? Well, first what I'll do is I'll tell you a little bit about us as well as our approach to the remodeling process because that's the way I'm going to approach this seminar. We're going to talk first about issues homeowners have, which is how our projects to begin, and the solu potential solutions to solve those issues, which is how our projects end. Um, then, the question is, so what is the goal? Since we don't have a specific project we're talking about, what's the general goal of remodeling? Well, every one of you, I assume, has walked into a home and it just felt good. You know, walking in, you go, man, I wish this was my house. That's what remodeling is. We're trying to make that your house. And, and so we're going to talk about what makes a home feel good. Then with that information, we'll turn to the 5-4 in the door, and we'll apply those concepts in, with the issues that are raised by the configurations in those houses and the problems that are brought to us by the homeowners. And then we'll open it up for questions. So let me begin a little introduction to the company. So as Patty mentioned, the company's been in business since 1989, 27 years. We are a full-service design-build residential remodeling company. Um, because of the number of these five foreign doors over the years, we've done a lot of them. Um, dozens in the past five years, and I happened in preparation for this seminar, went back and looked at the last 25 projects we've completed, 11 of them were in this style home. We currently have two in construction right now, and I got three more of the projects in design development that are also five fours and a door. Um, we basically, as I indicated, our, we work with our clients from the initial issue to the resolution. So from the initial discussion about the problems we're trying to solve through the completed construction project. So how does that begin? It starts like you would anticipate. I get a call from somebody who says they've got a project in mind, or my company gets a call. They've got a project in mind, and they'd like to talk to us about it. Well, as a design build company, what I recognize is their project is a solution to a problem. So I want to find out about the project. I want to find out what they see as far as the changes they want in their home. But more importantly, I'm trying to figure out what problem they're trying to solve. Because unless they've done a lot of remodeling or they've got, already got an industry professional that's helping them, there may be other ways to solve their problem they haven't thought about. There may be ways to solve their problem that are more aesthetically pleasing. Or, important for many homeowners, we may be able to solve their problem for less money. So 
That's where it begins. In the first phone call, I'm trying to draw out of them as much information, not only about the project, but about their home, how they use the home, what they're trying to do with this project to make it better for them. That phone call is followed by a visit to the house where that conversation continues. Now, most people tend to approach a project one room at a time. Well, a house isn't built one room at a time. It's built as a whole, and it only works well if everything works together. So to the extent that somebody may have a kitchen project, a basement project, a bathroom project, I want to know how it works with the rest of the house. If we're doing a project in the common area, it's one area of the common area, I want to make sure it integrates well with the other areas in the common area of the home. I want to make sure that I understand how people come into the home and how they flow to other areas of the house. How do they flow to different levels of the house? How do they flow in and out of the house? If it's a bathroom, a master bathroom is a common project, I want to know how that works with the bedroom. The master suite, how does it integrate with the rest of the home? And so we're del delving into all of this so that I have a good understanding of how we're going to solve their problem, but also make it work with the rest of the house. The other thing that, that I find is people tend to call and they have a problem, and it's the problem they're having today. Well, the problem they're going to have today may not be the same problems they're going to experience years down the road. Our typical client is living in a home for 10, 15, 20 years or more after we're done remodeling it. And if I meet with a couple that has some small children, for example, and they're, they're designing around these small children, great. I think that's great. We need, to, we need to make sure that the kids are taken care of. But they're not small for long. And before long, they're gone. And so in this whole discussion, I want to make sure that we're not only solving today's problem, we're solving the problem as the family grows and needs change. Only then, I now have a good understanding of what we're trying to accomplish, then I go through the space. But I haven't seen any of the spaces they've talked about yet because I don't want to be jaded by what I'm going to see. Once I look at the spaces, all I'm going to see is problems and obstacles. Until I look at the space, anything's possible. And I want to know what the dream is. Then we walk through the space, gives me a sense of what we're working with, and then we can talk about different options to take advantage of the spaces involved in this project. The goal is to then take all that information and come up with different options for how we might solve their problem and from those options find the best possible solution for them for the amount of money they want to invest in the project. Only then do we start construction because now we know where we're headed and then we build out the completed project. Okay? So that's the process. Now, tonight we don't have a project, so we're going to be talking in the abstract. So, I thought rather, because, rather than just simply limit our discussion to the abstract, I'd give you a real life example. Do you see how this works? So the project I have, I got contacted by a homeowner. They happened to live in a town home. The project they wanted was they wanted to redo their master bath and they wanted to add a sunroom addition. The issues they were trying to solve with the bathroom is it was outdated and chopped up. It basically was broken up into three separate areas. You had the vanity and tub area. You had the shower and toilet area. And in that space, you also had a linen closet. Then outside the space, you had a hallway that connected you to the bedroom and uh, the closet space. They thought all that space together was plenty of space for their bathroom. They just wanted it opened up and redone. With respect to the second part of the project, they tended to spend all their time in their existing den. But it was too small and it was dark. It didn't work well for the family. It was only worse when they got guests in. So what the, the sunroom was going to be, it was going to be the big room they didn't have. It was going to bring in a lot of natural light, and then that's where they could gather as a family, and that's also where they could uh, entertain their guests. So that was it. Then we dug deeper, and I found out a few things. You entered this home from, from the, the side, and then when you walked in, what you saw was this formal living room. Beyond it was this great little private patio. And what they shared with me is no one ever used this space. What did they do? They immediately turned left, and they headed down that hallway to the den and the kitchen area. Um, along the way, they passed the formal dining room, which was just tucked off in this dark little corner. And basically what they shared is, ideally, once they build that sunroom, that's where they're going to dine. When we got back and we started talking more, they said part of the problem with the den, it was so cramped because they had these built-ins and they had this corner fireplace. And they said, hey, we'd be willing to give that up if it provided more space. And then the last thing they shared with me was, here was where they anticipated that the sunroom would go. That's their entire yard. 
Um, I was standing on a retaining wall taking the picture, then it dropped off four feet and plummeted straight to the lake. <laughs> Beautiful view, but once we built the sunroom, there was no room left for this outdoor living space. And so what I asked them was, with their permission, would it be okay if we explore different ways to approach this project, which may or may not include a sunroom addition? And they said, sure, let's try it. So here's what we came up with. We ultimately did the project with no addition. The bathroom, we combined all those areas, the wet area, the vanity area, the hallway, consolidated it and made it one open space. They got their open bathroom. It happens to, the tub looks out onto that private patio, as does the water closet, which is right behind the tub. We also changed the entry. This entered from the bedroom, which was on the back of the house with the den. We switched it to the other side, so it now opened onto their former living room. And we converted the, converted the living room into their bedroom. They now have a nice, nice master bath that leads into a bedroom that has a private patio outside so they can have beverages on their own and not have to worry about the rest of the family outside the door. Outside what we went is we went back and remember they used to look down, people that came in, everybody was going to turn left and head to the back of the house and they had to go down that hallway. We took the wall out, opened it up, and we'll talk about the importance of that a little in a, in a little minute or in a minute. But basically we opened it up because that's the way people wanted to flow and I didn't want to obstruct their flow. We got rid of the formal dining room and we converted that into the sitting area. We then looked at the den. And on the right is where the, bedroom, the master bedroom, looking out the back to the lake. On the left was their den and their kitchen and a little eating nook looking with the same view. We basically took the master bedroom, the den, the kitchen, took out the built-ins, took out the fireplace, and took out the wall added some windows and gave them their sunroom. So now they've got that big den space. They've got their dining area that looks out over the lake. They still have the kitchen. And I happen to be over there this morning. We're talking to them about another project. They have put in the outdoor living space. And that whole area out there is now a beautiful stone patio with stones leading down to the lake. It's gorgeous. So at the end of the day, they didn't get the project they wanted, but it felt good. And I still feel good every time I go into this. I wish that was my home. So, um, so that's an example here. So let's talk about it. So this home feels good, at least to me. Um, what is it that makes a home feel good? There's typically five characteristics. One is it's well maintained. And let's start with what makes a home feel good is it's stress free. You walk into the house, you just the tension falls away. And so these are the components that make it happen. It's well maintained, it's cohesive, it's comfortable, it's functional, and it's current. And so we're going to talk about each of those. The first one is it's well maintained. It's clean, it's gutter free, it's in good condition, it's painted, there's no visible defects, everything works. Turn on a light switch, it goes on, you try to cook on the five burner grill, all five of them light up. Everything feels good. Where does the stress go? There's no stress. I don't have anything to do. I get to sit down and do whatever I want, watch the debate last night, not worry about any repairs. No stress there. Yeah, different kind of stress there. So, but that's basically what you're doing. So it's first thing and foremost is a well-maintained home tends to feel better than a poorly maintained, well-designed home. Um, so that's kind of the first step. The second one is cohesive. A cohesive space is when you walk in and everything at least feels like it's one continuous home. There's going to be different levels of finish in different areas, but overall it's not a shock every time you walk into a new room because it seems like you just moved to a new universe. Um, so the idea is that you're going to change the elevation of your finishes, but generally not in a huge dramatic fashion because it creates some anxiety. Space is proportional is another one is I get, frequently get people that they want to add on huge spaces. And so you walk into the home and their plan is you're going to have a bunch of small rooms. I got to work my way through and then boom, I open up into this big space. And all of a sudden it feels odd. And all of a sudden the front rooms don't feel good at all because they're totally out of whack. Why would I even go up there when I've got this back here? And finally, the furnishings and finishes that you put in are consistent. And so I use as, a, as an example of this is a show home. When you go into a show home, a different designer designed every room. So you walk into every room and every room is different. And then they tend to overdo it. I don't like, you go in and there's 15 different things to look at and then you go in the next room and there's another 15 things to look at. It just isn't common. A great source of information. But I rarely walk out and go, I wish I lived here. Um, 
So this particular example, what you see is a couple things. Their dining room is huge. They did a remodel about 13 years ago. They put in nice cherry cabinets, but they put it in the same space and the kitchen was too small. And so they've got this tight kitchen that feeds out to a large dining room. They also have this dark den in the back, not well lit with this dark finish. And then we got this bright red in the dining room. And then on the same floor, as they've got these nice cherry cabinets, when you walk into the bathroom that's shared between a guest bedroom and, and the guests as a powder room, they've got an acrylic tub. So they've got these nice cherry cabinets and all of a sudden I'm looking at a bathroom that's got an acrylic tub. They're not consistent. Now, I wish I could show you pictures of this project completed, but I just signed the contract this morning. We start in three weeks. All this is being torn out. Everything is gone. The kitchen's being yanked. The guest room beyond it's being pulled. We're opening up all of this. This, this space back here is being converted into a, the guest bedroom. Um, so we're going back and we're, we're resolving all of this, okay? Um, trying to make it consistent. The next one is comfortable. For many people, comfortable, they're thinking a Barca lounger, a nice comfortable sofa, and that's part of it. But there's things that make people feel comfortable in general. And the first is that the flow is easily understood. When people come into your home and they're not familiar with their house, if they don't know where to go, all of a sudden they're stressed. What am I doing? And all of a sudden they're opening doors. They got the linen closet, they got the, the powder room, and they're trying to find the door that leads to the main living area. And again, it's not comfortable. In this particular example, very wide open. This is a picture taken from standing at the front door. You walk in, there's no question where I'm gonna go. I can go anywhere I want. I know where the kitchen is, I know where the family room is. This, this house happens to have a lake view beyond, so if I wanna go out there and enjoy the lake view, I can go. We moved the stairs. The stairs used to be um, around the corner on the other side of the table. You didn't know where the stairs were. And then when they led down the basement, they, they were too tight and you ran into the wall. We moved the stairs so that it, when you were in the common area, you knew you had additional living space downstairs. And if you headed down there, you had a choice. You could see, hey, I can either go into the finished space or I can head out to the lake on the door straight ahead. So this one's kind of an over-exaggeration. I typically, we don't typically open them up this much. But this one, for flow and seeing where you're going, it, it does that. The next one is we want them safe with no dangerous conditions. The last thing you want is people coming into your home where they're afraid they're going to hurt themselves. In this particular case, if you look at it, that, that seating area is one step down. And, and they wanted to make sure, they wanted hardwoods throughout the space. Well, the problem is if you've got a consistent flooring material on two different levels, your eye doesn't pick up the transition. What the previous owner had had was a railing that ran all the way across and then there was this narrow opening. So you knew there was a transition, you had to find your way through that railing. They didn't want the railing, so what we did is we went in and we stained the nosing dark. My first proposal was yellow tape, they didn't like that one, so we came up with an alternative. <laughs> but that way there was a visual break in the floor and as soon as you came in, it was far enough away, you picked it up and so we did it. So we made this a safe home to flow through. Um, the next thing is minimal knickknacks and limited obstacles. This happens to be an example of a room where they've got stuff all over the place and, and you've got to weave your way through. You're going to knock into something, you're going to bang something over, and so instead of easily flowing through the room, you're conscious about what you are, what, uh, what's in, in your way. This is a common problem in a 5-4 in a door. The rooms tend to be small. People tend to put in too much furniture. And so people are, instead of being able to walk through the home, they're looking down to avoid obstacles. The lower the obstacle, the bigger the walk space needs to be. If it's up here, I can walk through that without hitting it. If it's down here, I gotta be looking down or I'm gonna stub my toe or break my neck, one of the two. So, so that's a couple things that you need to keep in mind as you're doing it. In remodeling, even if you can't afford to make the space bigger, take stuff out and it just makes the room feel better. The other one is light and bright. This is a very dark space, and you'll see later in the presentation it's very bright when we're done. The last thing is public and private. When people come into your home, I've given you an example, is you go into a home and they send you to, hey, where's the restroom? They send you down the hall, and you walk in, and it's a full bathroom with a shower. Well, you know you're sharing that space with somebody, and people don't like to be in your private area. So if you can, have a powder room that serves the common areas and the full bathrooms serves uh, a bedroom or halls or something else and divide up those spaces. So I always like to try in our design, anytime we're doing it, is try to give us a buffer between public and private spaces. We got a private, uh, we got the powder room and then the bedrooms are served by a full bath down the hall. Similarly, bedrooms, you don't, you don't look into the 
from the common area I can't see on the door and see a bed. It just makes people uneasy, right? And then the last thing is, and this is where you come into it, regardless of what I say, ultimately it's what's livable for you. You drive the project. The next one is functional. And functional goes back to this livable. It works for the family. That everybody, uh, if it, it, whatever your specific needs are, it serves that purpose. But one thing is every room should have a purpose. In my example, they had a living room they didn't use. So before I talk about expanding a house, let's make sure we're using the space we have. It should be inviting for guests, and, and as I indicated in earlier, is we want to make it easy for people to flow but between areas on the same floor, between floors, inside, outside. And so the design should accommodate that. And then we need adequate space. Small spaces are great for certain purposes, but you got to make sure it's adequate for the purpose you're trying to serve. Um, going back to every room has a purpose, I also don't like rooms where you have three rooms in the house that all have the same purpose because people will go to one. Basements are a typical example of people. They're framed exactly the way that it is upstairs, so they build it out exactly the way it is on the first floor. Well, why would we go down there? I've got to make my way down the steps, and I've got everything I want, and the basement is right up here on the first floor. So when I do a basement project, I'm looking at what are we going to do differently to make it work, and it has a purpose, so you're going to use it. All right? The last one is current, and that's simply that in your home, it's making sure that you know, you walk in, and if you're on a museum tour, it's great to tour a home that was built in the 1840s. But when people are coming into your home and when you're living in it, it's kind of nice to have some of the accoutrements that come with a new home. Um, and in remodeling now, the trend is away from things that are current now. They're current because they're timeless. And that allows you to have a home that basically will, will stay with you and work for you for years to come. But trends are, barn doors are big. Lighting, I showed you up there, LED lighting. The lighting is getting, I can tell you the age of the house by the size of the recessed can. They are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we're down to, they're still expensive, but I used to have a six inch can. We're now putting in two inch cans that put out the same spread and the same light. Um, so those are things that go in until when you walk in and you got some nice recessed cans, I look up, I can tell you when they went in, all right? So those are the characteristics we're looking for. So now let's look at the issues that we have. I'm sorry. We want to look at the issues in a five, four, and a door. So one of the things that we've talked about a lot of things, and some of you may be thinking, doggone it, now I've got to redo my whole house. All right? That may be the case. So you've got a choice. You either redo the whole house or you move. The, the other alternative is you take it in stages. And generally the way projects are tackled is in order of their visibility and use. So the first thing you would do is your common areas. In this case, we were reworking the whole first floor, opening up the family room to the kitchen, uh, taking out walls and everything else. So the common areas is where you spend most of your time. It's where your guests spend most of your time. The next one is the private spaces. This is where the homeowners spend most of their time. That's where the master suite comes in. Nothing better than a really nice kitchen, and then I go back and I got a really nice bathroom. Then you move to the other common areas. This is where you would go into a basement or a bonus room or a, a sunroom, that type of project. And then, then you worry about the kids and secondary spaces. We have the kids all down the road. You know, if, if the bathroom and the toilet flushes and the shower runs water, we're good. But at some point, you may run out of, of things to do, then we may take care of them. Um, and we do them every once in a while. This, one, this example on the bottom, project number four for this client. They got to number four, we did the other three. All right? Um, and then the last example is then you would typically start worrying about outdoor living spaces and things like that, because I, I now have tackled everything inside my house. So let's talk about the issues with respect to a 5-4 and a door. As I indicated, they're very similar. So we built a little model of a 5-4. So instead of just showing you pictures, we're going to walk through the home, and we're going to point out some of the problems. I'm going to walk through the house. And what you find in these homes is, as I said, the door enters in the middle of the, the windows on the first floor. And typically what you see when you come in, the door opens and you're, you're, being, you're greeting your guest and your guest is looking at the stairway and the dining room. If they turn around and they look to the left, they're going to see a formal living room. And so immediately people are trying to figure out where am I supposed to go. No one goes to the formal living room. The first thing they saw was the dining room. Well, that's a hint. Everybody wants to go to the kitchen, but generally you don't want to go through the dining room. And ultimately, by process of elimination, they pick the small door in the middle and go, there must be something down there. And so they're squeezed through the smallest opening we have to get to the next space. So we've started stress right away. We have a flow problem. 
for somebody that's not familiar with the house and trying to figure out where they're supposed to go. The next one is, we, but we do know that once we get through that space, typically what we find ourselves in is the family room. So as we go into the family room, we look left, and generally what you see is it's a fireplace flanked on two sides with built-ins. If you turn around and look the other way, so now if you put your back to the fireplace and look forward, you're now looking towards the kitchen, but you're typically looking at a door and a hallway that leads to the kitchen, and you gotta make your way through that. So a couple things, as you go into the hallway, you move in, there's, typic, there's a couple things usually dividing you from the kitchen. It could be a built-in bar, it could be a full walk-in bar area, closet space, powder room is, is always there, and then the stairs to the basement. But you feed through this tunnel and you got a narrow door opening, you pass all these things, and then you come out on the other side, and you're coming through and you're coming into a very tight kitchen. So here it is, and most of these are U-shaped kitchens, and you got a kitchen and a breakfast room um, space. Off of that space you may have, if it's got a bonus room, there will be sta back stairs that lead up to the bonus room. There will be a laundry room, sometimes it's off the front, sometimes it's in the back, sometimes it's straight ahead. Um, bonus rooms would also be off of this space that you have to get through through the kitchen. But generally, it is a traffic pattern where everybody is walking through your workspace. By and large, this is the most prevalent project we have in a five four and a door because this is where everybody is and it's extremely tight and doesn't work well. All right. From this space, we then move through the kitchen and you're going to go into the dining room. That leads you back up to the front foyer, and then you go back up the stairs. And when you're up to the stairs, basically what you have is in these homes at the top of the stairs, there's a single bathroom that serves the three bedrooms at the top. Um, and you enter all three rooms, enter through the hallway. The master bath is, or master bedroom and bath is to one side of the stairs or the other, and the other bedrooms are on the, on the reverse. If you go down and you'll look, these long hallways, if you've got a bonus room, you'll lead down all these rooms and you pop out in the bonus room, and then you can take the stairs back down and dumps you back out in the kitchen space. Um, when you get up into the master bedroom, the master bedroom and bathroom typically takes up the entire space from the back of the house to the front of the house with the bathroom lined up along the back wall and the rest of the space dedicated to the master bedroom and the closet if the closet isn't located in another room. Um, and, and frequently that's what's done is some of the space near the stairs is the closet and then you have all the space, the bedroom is as big and as wide as the uh, bathroom. But these bathrooms are all, and these are from different, pro different homes, all of them are long and narrow and sometimes chopped up where you've got the the shower and the toilet in one room, the vanity in another, sometimes uh, the tub is in even a third room. Um, so that's what you get there. The next space is the basement. When you get to the basement, that's where we're passing through that hallway leading into the kitchen. You look down the basement, you're looking at the front wall of the house, you can't see anything. And so it's a, it's a road to nowhere. Um, once you get down and you turn the corner, most of these are wide open. Some of them are divided up into rooms, but more often than not, you hit the bottom of the stairs, you turn, and you're looking at a big open space. They're usually low ceilings, and then they have a beam that's supporting the wall in the center of the room up above, so they'll have a drop down portion. So you look down, I got a low ceiling, and I got this beam hanging down into the space. And a lot of them, as you can see here, not a lot's been done to them because they don't know what to do with them. But that, in essence, is the entire space of a 5, 4, and a door. Um, so what do we do with one? Uh, not very comfortable. They don't flow very well. You keep getting squeezed down and popping out into new areas of the house. You can't really interact with somebody in another room because they're on the other side of a room or a, or a door or a hallway. And so most of the issues that come up with, with these homes is, how do we make it more open? How do we make people flow better? How do we use the space better? Um, and so we tackle these projects one at a time. We start with the front entry. As I said, most of the doors, you open up the door and you're looking at the stairway and the dining room, and that's not where we want people to head. So we change the swing of the door. Now when you open the door, your back as the host is against the stairway and your guests are invited into your home, and now at least they're down to just that small door at the end of the hallway or the formal living room, and they can quickly rule out the formal living room. 
So what, how do we get them to go down to that small opening? Well, the first approach is we just widen the opening. We eliminate the closet, we increase the size of the opening so it's more inviting, and they see more of what's beyond. The second one is if we don't have the opportunity to open it up, you soften that opening. Trim around an opening denotes a change of rooms. So to the extent that we want people to flow from the foyer into the back room, we, want it, we, we remove the trim. You soften it. So now there's a dining room to one side behind the trim. There's a formal living room over here with the trim, but there's no obstacle straight ahead. It's narrow, but I flow right through it. And it even works better if you remove all the paneling behind it or you paint that room the same color. Because then the color or a similar shade, it draws you into the space. All right? The other alternative is, in this project, what we did is we actually closed off the opening, retained the opening into the living room, but when you stepped into the living room, we combined the living room and the family room, and it was but one big space. And so they then, you came in, in that case, we again changed the door, but now they came in and they stepped immediately into the living area. In this case, we combined the two, and we eliminated both the living room door and the door at the end of the hall, and we did it at an off angle. So you walk in the foyer, and I got this big opening, no trim, all sheetrock, raise the openings. You walk in the door, there's no question, there's only one way to go. You either have to step over your guest to get to the dining room or you go through the big opening in front of you and you're into that big open area. All right. The last thing, and I see people, all right, so this one I talked about before, we changed the swing of the door so that people flow towards the family room and not through the dining room. Well, there may be a situation, and this happens to be one, where straight ahead, took you to another, you were a wall, and on the right was a guest bedroom, then the hall bath, which served the guest bedroom. Then you took a left and went through the kitchen, and then you went to a guest bedroom. Well, it, remember that thing about the public and private. If people went straight ahead, it forced them to go from the public foyer into the private guest suite area, pop out of the kitchen, and go to the, guest, or to the uh, family room, which was on the other side of the kitchen. And so what we simply accepted was what everybody did that knew the house, they went through the dining room. And so we accepted that that really was, in this home, the best way for them to travel. The problem with it before the project was they had to go into the dining room around the table, down past the chairs, and then they got to a little opening and they popped out into the kitchen. So we simply took out the whole wall. So now when you come in the door, open it, and you look into the dining room, I look right through the dining room and I can see my bonus room. And so I can see where I want to go. And so people flow through it. In the kitchen, you'll see we've got it configured. If they want to stop in the kitchen, they can sit down, but they never go in the workspace. They continue on through that area. The first five people show up, stay in the kitchen. The next 10 keep going. All right. So like I said, the flow isn't the same from house to house, and it depends on the unique requirements of the home. Next one is we get into the formal living room. So what do we do with the formal living room I talked about? This one is a room never used. So what do we do for most people? It just, it's out there, you put the, in, the furniture in, inherit it out there, no one wants to sit on that furniture, it's uncomfortable anyway, so you just put it out there on display and everybody passes it by. Well, again, I'm a big proponent of not having wasted space, so we're frequently changing this room. It makes a great office, put some doors on it, glass, you can see in it, but it then funnels them again down the hallway to the, to the family room. The other thing we'll do is when you reconfigure the space, we may move the kitchen so close to the front foyer, it makes sense. Put the dining room in the formal living room, and then it can easily, for the four times a year you use it, it's not that far, and then you display your dining room furniture when they come in the door. The other thing we did in this particular home, they basically wanted to preserve a private area. So what we did is we actually made the room smaller. We increased the opening down the hall, but we lost a coat closet in the process. So we basically created this paneled opening that gave us separation from the foyer and some privacy into that little seating area. And then the, panel, the panels actually opened and, and we got storage on both sides of the opening. Um, and then the last thing, and I see this a lot on projects that we come to. This is a project we worked on, but this was done before we got there. People open up between the family room and the uh, living room in the hopes that they're going to create one room. And my, my advice is if you're ever thinking about or you have a situation similar to that, do a floor plan of how the furniture lays out. Because what this does is it eliminates the wall in these small rooms that you used to be able to put furniture against. And so now you open it up and now instead of one big room, I got two rooms that don't work. Because I have no wall to put anything against. 
And that's what you're seeing a little bit of here is, you know, they didn't quite know how to use that space. So the kid, it became a kid's playroom. All right. Now we move to the family room, this dark, dreary space. What do we do? Well, the simple approach is you just paint it a lighter color. You add recessed cans. This is an older project. You can tell by the size of the recessed cans. Um, in this case, they had already opened up to the family room. And as you can see, they've got a chair right in the middle of that opening. They opened it up, and it didn't work with the furniture. The other thing is you combine the spaces. Um, this is a picture from the one where you walked in right through the formal dining room area, but we opened it all up. The one next to it is the one where we had the big opening, and we simply combined the spaces into one big room. And guess what? That one on the right is the one I used as a reference for one that had too much furniture, too many knickknacks, and it was too dark. That's the space now. All right. Um, next, we're going to talk about the family room to kitchen connection. The problem is there's a whole bunch of junk between the kitchen and the family room. I'd love to just take it all out, but it's not always practical. So how do we make a better connection between the area where you want your guests to be and the area they want to be, which is the kitchen? And so the first one, what we do is we soften it. We get rid of, instead of two doors, we take it down to one opening. And again, remove the trim, made the opening as wide as we could without interfering with the kitchen, raise that opening, and, and ease the transition. And by removing the built-in um, beverage center that was to the left and the closet that was to the right, I shortened it as much as possible. Um, I still have the powder room to the left. And then instead of, and this is something, is instead of having a solid door on the basement, we put a glass door in so that people, as they pass through, know you've got a finished basement. Um, I put the door on it if you need sound isolation. Take the door off if you don't. But the idea is, as soon as people know you have a finished basement, you just double the size of your house, and it didn't cost you anything but the price of a door. Did two projects in the past year where they didn't have a finished basement. All I did was finish it to the bottom. And so you walk past the door, you look down, holy, they got a great finished basement, but everything I want is up here, so I don't need to go down there. You hit the basement, go left or right, it's unfinished. Um, but they don't know that, so don't tell them. Um, the other thing we can do is you take the powder room, and most of these powder rooms are bigger than they need to be. We can squeeze them down, and it allows us to open up the hallway, which is what you're seeing here from the kitchen is looking back. The powder room is to the left. We made it smaller and we made the opening wider. Again, all these are tricks just to try and get the kitchen and the family room more closely aligned. Now we move to the kitchen. And this is, um, this is a challenge, right? And so most of these kitchens are small. This is where I get a lot of people asking me. They tell me they want to do their kitchen, and they, they need to do an addition. Well, why? Because my kitchen's not big enough. And that's why I do that inventory of what space is available to me, what are they willing to give up, that we can steal from to give them the larger kitchen without incurring the cost of the addition. Because kitchens are expensive. Add an addition, they're even more expensive. And the bad part about with the addition is we're creating bigger space that gets ex filled with expensive stuff. So we got to add more cabinets, more countertops, more appliances, because now it's too far to the refrigerator. I've got to have a beverage refrigerator uh, because I don't want to go all the way out there. Um, and so those costs, and so the question is, why, why do it? And so I am constantly looking for ways to use the existing space. In this first example, what you see is we shrunk the dining room. And we created this, this thick pass-through. We opened it up. We made this thickened pass-through. But if you look at the other side of the pass-through, which is down here, there's cabinetry built into the other side. So that's where the kitchen had, we had additional storage for the kitchen, but it made this nice transition between the dining room. So we stole space from the formal uh, dining room, but you don't know it. Um, and it created a great space. The other thing we did in this project is we softened up the transition. So you'll see the, the opening that led down the hall. Now we raised it up to the ceiling, took out the opening. It just flows, the sheetrock flows right into that hallway. And it does the same thing on the other side. We also expanded the opening into the sunroom that they had. So now it, instead of going through a door into that sunroom, this is where they have breakfast every morning. It's now wide open, and it easily flows in and out of this space. Okay. In the next example, um, we took the whole dining room all together. People have less need for a breakfast area and a formal dining room. Like I said, most people are using it a couple times a year. So we took out the entire dining room wall. and. Basically now, and that was the picture I showed you earlier, which was closer up. We widened the opening to the family room, but we basically put in a large table that serves as both informal and formal dining space, created this big open space. 
We eliminated cabinets on the back wall and opened it up for windows out the back so it feels nice and open and you can look out to the back. And then all of our cabinetry, so we lost a lot of walls for cabinetry, so all of them got shoved up against the wall. We moved the garage door into the laundry and converted that into a combination laundry mudroom and then used that space for the storage that they needed for the kitchen. All right, so this, in this case, we're stealing space from that area. Here's an example, and I said that there's a lot of stuff between the kitchen and the family room, and it's not always practical to remove it. In this case, we did. So when you're looking at this, you're standing in the formal living or for, in the family room, you're looking down the hallway. On the left is a powder room. On the right is a hallway that leads to the basement stairs. Off of that hallway is a pantry. This is on the opposite side, standing in the breakfast room, looking through the kitchen at that same hallway. We basically moved the powder room, incorporated the pantry space into the kitchen, and took it all out. So if you look at this picture right here, that's what it looks like now. Wow. All right. So it's another situation where we got, we got an island, but we had no space for cabinets on the other side. And most of these homes are too narrow, and that's what people see. I want an island, but I have room for cabinets, space, island, space, cabinets. The rooms aren't big enough, so what we do is we eliminate one side of the cabinetry. And in this case, we move the cabinetry down a ways. We then redid their laundry, and we moved the door again, so you entered into the laundry. It also served as a landing zone mudroom, but it freed up wall space for cabinetry again because we didn't have the, the space we needed directly in the kitchen, and that's where all the long-term storage went. Okay. Um, so that's the kitchen. And then this is tied in. This one happened to have the sunroom. This actually, their first thought was that they would expand the kitchen into this room. But that's the room that worked for them. They spent all their time there. I said, why are we going to destroy that room? You don't use the rest of the house. Let's try to make the kitchen work better with the rest of the house. And ultimately what they did is they took all their furniture out. We did the remodel. We rebuilt the sunroom. And they put all their furniture right back in. And they continue to live the way they want, but with the kitchen that actually allows them to easily flow in and out. Um, last kitchen we have, this one um, is looking back. This one we took no space from anywhere. We basically, their first thing is they wanted to bump out the kitchen eight feet. My concern was the kitchen was going to be huge and disproportionate to everything else. But we put it on paper, I gave them the price, and they said maybe we shouldn't bump. And so what worked out well was we actually were able to scale back, but we used almost all the features of the design we came up with in the expanded version and scaled them back. And basically, but we stayed within, all we did was we, we eliminated the, the breakfast table and we put seating at the island um, and we basically didn't have to expand the footprint of the house and they got the great space and this is the one that you flow in. And so now standing here, I'm in the uh, family room, look back, you can see the front door. So as people come in, they're looking right to where they're headed in this project. All right, the master suite, as I said, most of these are long and narrow. So it's a matter of, and they limit a lot of storage. So what we're doing in the design on the master suite, the bathroom specifically, is we're getting creative. These are long, narrow spaces. So it's, it's lining up the stuff. It's opening it up to make it feel as big. Get rid of all the intervening walls, glass showers, things like that, so it feels better. And then you'll see a lot of different storage components in there, towers, cabinetry, slide outs. These drawers actually you pull out and there's two layers because that, you know, it's a toothbrush and toothpaste, how deep do they need to be? You open it up, there's one layer, you push it back, there's another layer. So there's a lot of creative ways to take use of space. In the master bedroom itself, what we're trying to do is we're trying to step it up. Most of the, all these are on the second floor. What do I have above it? Attic. So in this one, we basically vaulted the ceiling, the one on the left, and the one on the right, we've trayed it and added lighting. And so basically we stepped up the master to a nicer level than the rest of the house and took advantage of the empty space that was the attic without doing anything to the roof. Right. And then the other thing we're commonly looking for in the master is closet space. So we'll either steal space out of the existing bedroom or frequently we'll take a bedroom, adjoining bedroom and uh, convert it to closet space. But that's what makes this all work is it has the capability to store all their belongings and they can enjoy their time there. Secondary baths and bedrooms, typically we're just going back and that's where it's a lower priority. We're typically not doing a lot of modifications. We're simply updating them, new finishes, things like that. Um, the other thing we're looking for is 
Uh, so that just shows right here, here, we did an update of this bathroom within the existing space. We're also looking for options for other bathrooms. So to the extent we've got three bedrooms all working off one, when you have guests over there sharing it with your kids, it's somewhat uncomfortable. So to the extent we can, we're trying to find a place that we could have a dedicated bathroom for your guests. In this case, behind the door is a shower. This is a small bathroom, but it's a full bathroom and they've got some privacy. And then the last thing we're looking for is all of these have small closets. And so any way we can, we are stealing storage and creating space uh, in the, throughout the upper level in the bedrooms to provide people areas where they can put their things. All right. That brings us to our last section, and that's the basement. As I said, typically you'll see it right here. Around that corner is the stairs up to the top. And so our, our first thing, what we're typically doing is we're opening up the stairs so that when you're at the top of the stairs, you can see down and you can see that it opens up to the rest of the house. And then we're going back in. This one had that situation where the ceiling heights were different and the beam dropped down about three inches. Well, I couldn't push the beam up, but it actually made the space feel better to lower the ceiling three inches overall than have that thing dropping down three inches. And you'll see up in the corner, we actually had to push, we pushed up the ceiling at the stairs so you didn't come down and you transition to the lower ceiling as you entered the space. By turning the stairs, we also created space up against the front wall. So they've got storage on both sides and then we built in the kitchenette. In the next example, same thing. We opened up the stairs um, and we opened up the space. And this one, basically, what we were trying to do in all of these is make it a destination. This really was a kid's entertaining space or an adult's entertaining space. Same thing over here. The other things we'll add. This is where we had a project where we turned the stairs. They weren't quite ready to go to the next step, but we did the same thing we had in this project is we developed, we had space that we could use for something. What they said in the future, they really like a nice wine cellar. So we designed the space for the wine cellar and framed the wall. So all I gotta do is cut out the sheetrock, knock out a couple studs. I can put in the niche, the window and the door and finish out the wine room. Um, other things that we'll do, exercise rooms, I, supposedly it's going to draw you to the basement for many people. It's never used, and they, except for whoever's responsible for going down and dusting. Um, bar areas, and then saunas. All right. So ultimately, these are features generally not found on other levels of the home. We put them in the basement. Now you've got a reason to go down there. And that basically concludes it. We've basically gone through the house, and we've redesigned it from top to bottom. So I'm going to open it up for questions.